I am just so excited about this. And uh, Romans chapter 11, we're going to look at the four, first uh, or the last four verses in Romans chapter 11, and we're really probably going to you know focus on the, the last six. And uh, I just want to say, by the way, thank you to, to uh, Grace School of the Bible for the invitation uh, to speak. It's a, it's a privilege, and, and again, this is such a wonderful uh, topic that we're going to cover this morning. Uh, I've not been able to hear all the messages uh, just due to work and things like that, but I have no doubt that the, the brothers and, and, you know, we know them and know how they teach and preach, and we all have the same book, and you know they're hitting the points that they, they need to hit to give you some understanding, and, and I really think I got one of the best topics of the week because I get to take all that needlework that they thread through those three chapters of Romans 9, 10, and 11 and just kind of knot it and kind of put that, you know, that final uh, stamp on it, and it's it's just really a wonderful passage. If you will, look at Romans chapter 11 and verse 30. Now, you guys have been kind of quiet. There you go. Alex was talking about, uh, in Hosea, he talks about the calves of our lips, and, or calves of Israel's lips, you know, not calves of sacrifice, but their lips. And no one wants weak, skinny calves. Uh, so let's work them out. Uh, so amens, hallelujahs, all that stuff's welcome. Uh, this is a wonderful passage. Romans 11, verse 30. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, talking about Israel, uh, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. O oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again." For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time of study, the time to get together, and just to, to enjoy your word, to enjoy the truths that we find here. And I just pray that these things, uh, that we allow them to just get a hold of us, uh, and to capture our hearts, and that we just uh, find ourselves thrilled with your wisdom and your glory, all vested in the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and we thank you in his name. Amen. Now here in Romans 9, 10, and 11, these three chapters, as, as has probably been you know, reiterated a number of times uh, this week already, Paul begins in, in Romans chapter 9. Keep in mind, this is the, uh, that third uh, pillar, uh, as it were, of establishment in the book of Romans. The first five chapters, Paul establishes the believer in the issues of God's grace and justification. And when you move on to chapter 6, 7, and 8, Paul is going to now introduce the subject of our sanctification. You've been dead uh, to sin, you're crucified with Christ, and now he's given you the ability to walk in newness of life because you have his indwelling spirit and all of that. And then come to chapter 9, 9, 10, and 11, he's going to describe now and give us some detail, begin to give us some details uh, to the believer regarding the status of Israel in light of Paul's ministry and in light of this mystery dispensation. So Paul begins to unravel these, these details about what is, what, what's going on with the nation Israel. And it's interesting, you're reading the book of Romans, a book written to Gentiles. And, and all this time, he's talking about all these blessings that we have in Christ and all these riches that we have in Christ based on, on Calvary's cross and all of that. And, and wait a minute, that has never been God's program before. That's never been God's uh, uh, mission with, with the Gentiles, to give them such blessing and, and apart from the nation Israel. So now he's going to, to unpack that, that information. Now, in Romans 9, what the, what the details cover in Romans chapter 9, kind of just generally speaking, is how that God reserves the right to pause what he's doing with Israel and to pursue another purpose. Chapter 10 deals with Israel as a whole, how they, they sought their own righteousness. Do you remember Luke chapter 18, verse 9, where he tells the, the he, he gives the account of the, uh, the Pharisee and the publican? And he says, he said this because they trusted in themselves. That was Israel, that's Israel's status. Instead of seeking the righteousness of God by faith, seek, they sought their own righteousness, as it were, by the works of the law. And yet, God does have a believing remnant. And so in chapter 11, God uh, talks about the status of Israel as a whole. As a whole, as, as a commonwealth, Israel has fallen. 
they are cast away. They are in unbelief, and, and we see that there in verse 30 and 31. And yet God will fulfill his promise to the nation. God will restore Israel. The deliverer will come out of Zion and, and deliver uh, 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 Jacob. Uh, what, 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 how does that verse go there? Shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. It says the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So now we're going to look at, when you come to verse 30, God makes some conclusions. He concludes some things about this information. Now, just real quick, and so you have this in the frame of your, you know, reference when we get to verse 33. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. So question, in regards to what? Paul just can't contain himself. He breaks out in praise. And, you know, when you study this passage, you kind of start to begin uh, to appreciate uh, what this is, just the excitement of this, because you're going to see how it impacts you as, as Gentiles in, in the big scheme of things. So he says, The depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways, past finding out, in regards to what? And what we're going to see there is it's in regards, the, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God are in, uh, in respect to what he's done with his program change. That he's done something with the nation Israel and that he's pursuing something with the Gentiles today through their fall. And we're going to see his wisdom, this unsearchable wisdom, we're going to see it on display. And we're going to see the, the knowledge and, and the wisdom of God in his judgments all on display in what he's doing today in the dispensation of grace. So now there in verse 30, and let's just kind of follow the flow of the verses. In verse 30, here Paul writes and, and comes to this conclusion, For as ye, Gentiles, in times past. So we talk about this timeline and this chart, and we, we recognize when Paul talks about time past, but now in the ages to come. And he says in time past, so there's, there's an identifier there, that ye in times past have not believed God. Now he's going to say in a little while there, that he's concluded them all in unbelief, and we'll talk about that in a little detail. But see, keep in mind, the, the Gentiles, the nations, were already concluded in unbelief. And there was a moment in human history where God did that with the nations. He says, ye in times past have not believed God. Now, on that point, come with me to Genesis 1. Keep your hand there in Romans. And look with me at Genesis chapter 1. There was a point in history where God concluded the nations in unbelief. Where he, 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 de he demonstrates that the nations, that the Gentiles, the families of the earth, are, are uh, he's going to do something different. They're in unbelief. Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1, let's start in the beginning, that makes sense. Someone said, what do you need to do to understand Israel? Well... Read Genesis through Malachi a couple hundred times and, you know, things will kind of work out and then, you know, pick it up later. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And there's a declaration of, of God's kingdom, of his creation, heaven and earth. But when you continue on from this point, the focus of prophecy, the focus of God's word from this point forward is his purpose in the earth. Now, God creates man. Uh, if you're taking notes, Psalm 115, verse 16 says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth gave he, he hath given, rather, to the children of men. God, when he created heaven and earth, he had a purpose for his creation. He had a purpose for the earth. And prophecy focuses on God's purpose for the earth. And he gives the children of men the earth. To, to, to serve him. Now that's what he does with Adam in the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, notice verse 7. Verse 6. Genesis 2, verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. We know earlier in chapter 1, and you'll see there in verse 26, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. God creates man. 
and, and, and man is to, is to inherit the earth and, and to have dominion over God's creation on the earth and to serve as his, as his re, uh, region in the earth, as his agent, and to, and to reclaim earth. You know, there's a spiritual warfare going on here, and there's, there's, we learn about Satan's, uh, you know, his desire to be like the most high possessor of heaven and earth. And God has a plan for the earth, and he puts man in the earth. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where he says, uh, he talks about the, the first man was earthy. That's why. He says, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. Reclaim it, subdue it. Now, we know man forfeits his privilege to serve God on the earth as, as he was originally called to do. And he forfeits it to, to Satan. And as man populates the earth and as, as families uh, develop, the families of the earth really demonstrate that they, they take on this marred image and likeness of their father. They, they take Adam's image and his likeness and they possess Adam's nature and have sin. Now come with me, you're there in Genesis 1, 2, and uh, come with me to Genesis chapter 11. And as they are fruitful and multiply, we, we, we know the, the account of Noah's flood and all of that, and then they replenish the earth. Now, Genesis chapter 11, the earth really just stands in defiance against God. Mankind, humanity, just rebels against God. And that's because in, in, in and of ourselves, that's who we are in our nature. We're rebellious. We're enemies. Now, Genesis chapter 11, and you got, I said, hold your hand there in Romans. Grab Romans chapter 1. Genesis chapter 11 and Romans chapter 1. Notice verse 1 of Genesis chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the, the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them. Now notice this part, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of, the, uh, of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now Romans chapter 1, and you notice in verse 21, now I want you to keep Genesis in, in mind, uh, chapter 11 there in mind, Romans 1 verse 21, now, notice the language in verse 21. And this verse here explains how the nations became, uh, you know, or, or, you know, how they got to be in the predicament that they found themselves in. Uh, Genesis, uh, Romans chapter 1, rather, in verse 21. Because that when they knew God. There was a point in time where they knew God. They glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their, what? In their imaginations. Remember back there in Genesis 11? He says they're, they're going to do what they imagine to do. See, in, in man's thoughts, in our, in our thoughts, our sin nature, we imagine to do the things that are contrary to God. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. We learn in Genesis 10, Nimrod, that, 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 that king, that mighty hunter before the Lord. You know, he says, thou shalt not have other gods before me. Or Christ, who is before all things, that's not just a timing issue, that's his, his place and his preeminence. Nimrod, in defiance, and, his, and you learn about his kingdom there. He develops a kingdom, he develops a city in defiance against God. And we know God does have a city, and he does have a kingdom. And we're going to see what he promises uh, to Abraham here in a minute. But you see those two systems established, Baal worship. Defiance against God. That's where the nations find themselves. 
Right here in Romans 1, verse 22, they professed themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, and so on and so forth. What you're going to see there is that God gives the nations up. He gives them up to, uh, to uncleanness. And you go on, he says, God gave them up, verse 26, unto vile affections. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. All of that activity that you read in those verses is going on in Babel. And it goes on today. And so what is God's response to the nations? I'm giving you up. I'm giving you over. Now, Genesis chapter 12, and we know that God, now by the way, how do you know God gave the nations up and over in Genesis chapter 11? Genesis chapter 12, and also grab Isaiah 51. Look at Isaiah 51 and verse 2. Isaiah 51, verse 2. Look unto Abraham, your father, and unto Sarah that bare you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. God takes a look at, at, at the world and takes a look at the world's rebellion and at the nations, and he calls out one man alone. Well, if he calls out one man, guess who's ex who he is excluding? Everybody else. And there's your answer. Now, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. Notice it's singular. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So Abram, Abraham, Get, get, your, get out of your country, separate yourself from these nations. I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to promise you a land, and I'm going to make of thee a great nation. And now he says, all the families of the earth, you'll see there in verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee all families of the earth be blessed. Now God has a plan of salvation and redemption for the families of the earth, but it's going to be through one man's seed, and that's Abraham. And so we know that he, he makes a, a covenant with Abraham. He promises Abraham a, a seed, a land. So they have a people, they have a land. He gives them a law. He promises them a king. And you have all the ingredients of a kingdom. And that's all going to come through Abraham's seed. And you have the nation Israel. Now, Ephesians chapter 2. And when you go through Scripture, you're going to see God's estimation of the Gentiles in, in prophecy. And it's really not very high. It's not a very high view, you know. Notice Ephesians 2, just for time's sake. We'll, just, we'll, we'll come here in one other passage. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past. He said, guys, you in time past, you were an unbelief. In Romans 11. That ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. What a depressing state to be in. No hope. You think about hopelessness. You know what that spurs on? Depression. You're alone. They didn't have God to turn to. You know, what do you turn to? Your idols? You know, your substance? Wine? I tell people, my wife and I, we enjoy wine every night. We put the kids to bed, and we listen to them whine. <laughs> every night. They take shifts, you know. I got 8 to 10. I got 10 to 12, and then the little one comes in and says, I got an idea. I'm going to wet the bed and freak out. 
<laughs> you know how it is. And they do it on Sundays. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know how it is, too. You, you select, you finally dial in. Oh, this is so funny. You guys will relate. You dial in the right number on your select discomfort mattress, and you're melting into your pillow, and then someone screams, you know, bloody murder, and it's like, you know, whatever. But no hope without God. <laughs> oh, man. So we decided to have another, you know? It's like, well... <laughs> He says, you were without Christ. By the way, when he says you were without Christ, you Gentiles, when did Christ come? There in the gospel accounts, that tells you that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is in time past. He says, you were without Christ. John 1 says he came unto his own. Now his own received him not, but he came unto his own. Israel had claim on their king, on their Messiah. The Gentiles were without Christ. He says, you are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. That's God's chosen people, Israel. The Gentiles, he says, you guys are strangers. Israel, you are my children. No hope. They have an earthly hope. Without God, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What a contrast. Come with me to Isaiah 40, and we're going to come back here later on because Paul does quote this passage, and it's important to look at it. Isaiah chapter 40, notice here, and this is really, again, just an uplifting type of description of, of you know, who you were in your ancestry. Notice verse 12, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and, and meted out heaven with the, with, his, with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor hath taught him? Uh, with whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding? Now, notice, behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket." and counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing, and vanity. So when God says, nations, I'm done with you, and then Israel, Abraham, he calls him out, and he promises him a seed, and a land, and a law, and a king, and a kingdom. When he does all of that, he looks back and says, you guys are vanity. You are nothing. You are a drop of a bucket. That's who we were as Gentiles, as na in, in, in the nations. And Israel is, is that chosen, blessed, favored people. Psalm 147, verse 18, we won't turn there, but he says he, he's given his word to Jacob. See, Israel had claim on God's word. They were to be a blessing to the families of the earth. They were the ones to minister God's word to the nations. Now, how did Israel do? Not too good, yeah. Look with me at Acts chapter 7. If you want a nice reader's digest of Israel's history and rebellion, Acts chapter 7 is a good starter. And here Stephen, he, as he's indicting the, the, the religious apostates in Israel, he gives an account of their history and he lays out the case against his nation. Acts chapter 7, notice verse 51. And you guys know a lot much of, you know, again, if you want to learn about Israel's history and their Baal worship and their rebellion, Genesis through Malachi is a good starter. Uh, but here, we'll just start with Acts 7, verse 51. He says, ye stiff-necked. So here's Stephen's conclusion. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the, uh, the betrayers and murderers. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. You know, you think about what Paul says in Philippians 3. 
a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the he Hebrews, touching the righteousness of the law, blameless. And he says, you guys, you guys received the law, you've not kept it. See, it's that issue of trying to establish their own righteousness and not approaching God in faith. And he makes this indictment against the nation Israel, and Stephen tells him, you are uncircumcised in heart and ears. You're not, you're not willing to believe. You're not able to believe. Because of, uh, of your blindness and your rebellion and your obstinance. And when they heard these things, verse 54, they were cut to the heart. So he got, to, he got the point across. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Remember in Acts chapter 2, Peter says about Jesus of Nazareth, who is exalted and seated at the right hand of the Father. When they hear him say that, they know exactly who he's talking about. The one that you by wicked hands have crucified and slain. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's the one who has power to judge and to pour out his wrath. And he's coming. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and they rocked him to sleep. They stoned him to death. You know? Now we know that in this, and we're not going to go through the details here, but you know that in prophecy, he says, I see the, the Son of Man standing. That sign of, of, of God standing is a sign of judgment, is a sign of wrath. Psalm 110, Psalm chapter 2, Isaiah, or, uh, I believe it's Isaiah chapter 3, or Jeremiah chapter 3. I don't know. Look it up. <laughs> it's in there somewhere between Genesis and Revelation. <laughs> but come with, you're, you're in Acts, Romans 9. Romans chapter 9, I believe Matt, uh, Brother Matt Holly covered this. Romans chapter 9 and verse 22. See, in Romans chapter 11, while you're grabbing Romans 9, he says, For as ye in times past, you Gentiles, have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed. Israel is in a status of unbelief. Romans chapter 9 and verse 22. Uh, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, was God willing to do that in Acts chapter 7? Yes. Willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Instead of pouring out wrath and instead of pouring out judgment, he pours out grace. He pours out long-suffering. He pours out mercy. And when you come back to Romans 11, that's what you see here. Now, he's gonna, there's a lot of details there in, in between that explain how that happens. Notice verse 30. As ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy. How? Through their unbelief. Now, this is important to notice. Verse 31. Even so have these also now not believed that through your... Mercy. Whose mercy in verse 31? Gentiles' mercy. See, Israel didn't have any mercy to, 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 you know, there was no more mercy for Israel. It was wrath. Wrath was due. God had been plenty patient, plenty long-suffering, and plenty forgiving with the nation Israel up to that point. And wrath was due. And, and now, the, the wording here is very important. It's the Gentiles' mercy that God, that God dishes out. Why? It's through Israel's unbelief. Notice Romans 11, 11. How is it that God can judiciously, righteously, properly pause what he's doing with Israel to pursue another purpose? I mean, we understand he's God. He's got the right to do that. But think, Israel was in, a, it was in a place of unbelief, of castaway, of fallen. And right then and there, God can say, I'm going to pause what I'm doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withhold wrath to do something else, to accomplish another purpose. He didn't disrupt it while the Lord was on earth. 
He disrupts his plan and program with Israel because wrath was ready to fall. And God, in essence, spares Israel the wrath, the trouble, but under new terms, under new conditions. Israel, you're not my favored, chosen, blessed people today. You are cast away. You are fallen. You will be diminished. And now salvation is through the Gentiles. But that's made possible because of the fall of Israel. Notice verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So that, that trigger point where God says, I'm going to do something different now and, and, and have mercy and, and grace on the Gentiles is because of Israel's unbelief and because of their falling. They fall and he does something different. He suspends the wrath. He, he doesn't dispense wrath. He dispenses grace. Verse, keep reading, verse 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Now you're going to see kind of this back and forth with, with Israel and the Gentiles. They're, they're set aside. God's pausing what he's doing with them, but he'll pick it up one day. He's going to fulfill his promise, but now he's doing something different. It's the riches of the Gentiles. It's the riches of the world. Verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation. There it is. Them which are my flesh and might save some of them. You know, God in history dealt with Israel as a commonwealth, as a unit, as a whole. And under the dispensation of grace, under the program change, he's dealing with individuals. It's not that he might save all of them. That's his prayer in Romans 10.1. It's that he might save some of them. How are you going to come to salvation? As an Israelite who's cast away. I'm going to have to individually put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection and be a part of what God's doing in this dispensation. That's it. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? He's going to receive them one day. They're going to be uh, uh, raised, as it were. But he says the casting away of them is the reconciling of the world. God changes the status, as it were, of, of the world. One of, you guys were in unbelief, you're far from God, you're enemies, you've got wrath coming, and yet he reconciles the world in peace. That's not some nonsense about everyone's got their sins forgiven. You know, that stuff goes around, get that straight. You know, that, that rec you know the reconciling of the world means that, that God's, you know, brought everybody together in forgiveness. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that he's changed the status of the world as, a, as far off, and now brought them nigh so they have the opportunity, apart from the nation of Israel, to receive salvation by the cross of Christ. If I sound angry, I'm not angry. I'm just... <clears throat> yeah, I'm pumped. I'm going to try and tone it down. Calm down. Good luck. Casting away of them is the reconciling of the world. God is now pouring out his grace and peace to the world. Now, back there at Romans 11. Verse 31. Even so have these also now not believed, talking about Israel, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. You know, it's interesting. Israel was to be a blessing to the nations. And they were to minister the word of God to the nations. And they're going to do that in the millennial kingdom. That great commission will be fulfilled in that time. And they will operate as ministers and priests of God. They were to fulfill that Abrahamic covenant. They were to live as God is, who, who, in, in, in who God created them to be as the nation Israel, as his chosen people. And they forfeited that. And now the Gentiles are a blessing to Israel. Now the Gentiles have the word of God, and they've got a message to the world, including the Jews. It's amazing how he just turns everything on its head. They obtain mercy. God spares Israel, but under a new program. 
For God hath concluded them, he's talking about Israel, all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Israel falls, they're no different than the nations, and God has mercy. Now you come to verse 33. Come with me to, well, read verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out, or who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor. Now we'll stop there. And you look at God's genius. You look at God's wisdom on display. I'm going to stop something with the nation Israel to, do it, to accomplish another purpose. Now we're going to learn more details about that in the book of Ephesians, but he, he has mercy. He has, and this was something that was prepared in his heart all along. And God puts on display this wisdom and his genius to accomplish two purposes, one on the earth through Israel, and now he's pursuing one for the heavenly places through the body of Christ. That wisdom and knowledge is, 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 uh, is pertaining to what he's done in his program change with man. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Now again, verse 11. Remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called uh, the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So we've seen that. But now, so now we're, now we're functioning under this grace age. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's the means by which God can do this because of Christ's work at Calvary. For he is our peace who hath made both one. Now, keep in mind, a lot of times people read that passage and they'll say, God is taking Israel, that unit, that commonwealth, and Gentiles, and he's putting them in one body. That's not what the passage is saying. God isn't taking Israel and Gentiles and making them one in one body. He's taking Jew and Gentile and putting them in one body. You cannot have the body of Christ without the fall of Israel. That's what Romans 11 teaches. You cannot have salvation uh, under this dispensation the way it is without the fall of Israel. For he is our peace, verse 14, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make of himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Remember uh, Rahm Emanuel when he was the chief of staff for Obama, President Obama, and he in an interview said, you, you never want a crisis, you never want to see a crisis go to waste. And everybody's hair caught on fire. Oh, you know, oh. You know, if somebody else said it, they'd be fine with it. You know, that's kind of biblical. And that's what God did. He didn't let a crisis go to waste. God takes, he'll take an evil situation and he'll accomplish good with it. He'll take a crisis. Now, you didn't think I'd be quoting Rahm Emanuel. He's the mayor of Chicago. Look, Numbers 22, he can talk through a donkey. Mayor of Chicago, no problem. Uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> a lot of people quote scripture and they don't know it. Verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Notice verse 15, he says, to make of himself of twain one new man. Back to Romans 11, well, Isaiah 40. Romans 11, as you're turning there to Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 34, he says, who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? 
And that's a quote out of Isaiah 40. We just read it a moment ago. Notice, and I want you to see verse 12 in this. And you really, if you read all of Isaiah 40, it's really quite interesting, the flow of things. And think about why Paul quotes this passage there in Romans 11. He'll also do it in 1 Corinthians 2. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, talking about God Almighty, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, who hath taught him, with whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed to him the way of understanding. Behold, the nation are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. He says, you nations, you Gentiles, you are the dust of the earth. Think about what's going on in Romans chapter 11. He's making one new man. God takes the dust of the earth. Oh, I just love this. The nations, as it were. He takes the dust of the earth and he forms one new man. And God, by his word, by the gospel, breathes into that man the breath of life. You have his indwelling spirit. Isn't that amazing? As a member of the body of Christ, when you, when you join the body of Christ, you have God's Holy Spirit. And you're made in the image and likeness of your creator. He says, he talks about the new man who's made after the image of him that created him. Now, remember 1 Corinthians 15? He, the first man is earthy, has an earthly purpose. It's talking about Christ, whose image and likeness you bear, spiritually and one day physically. He says he's heavenly. He's a quickening spirit. God takes the dust of the earth, the nations, forms one new man, breathes into him the breath of life, adorning his heavenly creation. It's amazing. And that's God's genius, that's God's power, that's God's wisdom. Isn't that thrilling? That I was, we were far off. We were a long way away from God, no hope. Sitting there, you know, finicking with our select discomfort mattress. Kids freaking out. No hope, no God to pray to. And he changes that. And he says, I'm going to pause what I'm doing with the nation Israel, and I'm going to accomplish another purpose and form this new man, this new agency, who's going to accomplish my, and this is the best part, a secret, unsearchable. We're going to go back to Romans 11. And as we're going to come to a close here, and I really think we will this time. You know, a lot of times you say that, and it's like, you know, it's like when someone says, I'll be there in 15 minutes. That means 45 minutes, you know. I'm running late. I'll be 15 minutes late. No, I'll just put the, you know, Keep the crock pot on. But I got five minutes, well, four minutes now, so we'll, we'll get it done. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? And a lot of times people take this passage and it's this idea that we can't fathom what God's doing today that we can't possibly appreciate and know God's purpose and his will and all that business. And that is nonsense, and we're going to see why. Don't glorify yourself in ignorance. Don't do that. Get in the book and learn, because he's made it known. We'll see this. The depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. Uh, you had Ephesians 2 a moment ago. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Notice verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given. He's talking about his ministry there. He's talking about the word of grace, as, you know, as he talks about in, in Acts 20. That, that message and that ministry that he was given by the Lord Jesus Christ, that grace of God given unto me by the effectual... I'm reading the wrong verse, aren't I? No, I'm not. Verse 7. That was a test. 
um, given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me whom the less, uh, the less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. It's unsearchable in the sense that you can't find it there in prophecy. You can't find it there in Israel's program. It's without a trace. But he says that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. He's made it known. It's being preached today. He says, oh, the depth. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Both of the knowledge and wisdom of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. 1 Corinthians 2, look at verse uh, 7. Oh, man, go to verse... I get in trouble every time I do this, but verse 5, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5. That your faith, 1 Corinthians 2, 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now listen, your faith, your trust should never rest in my opinion, in your opinion, in my faith in God's word, shouldn't rest in my wisdom. It should rest in what saith the Lord. Not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He talks about that there in chapter 1. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak wisdom, but we speak wisdom among, I'm reading the same verse twice, sorry about that, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had Satan and his cohorts knew what we're talking about today, they would never have crucified Christ. But as it is written, and this is what I want you to see, verse 9, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, if you stop there, you got problems. He quotes that passage there in, from, in prophecy. Keep in mind, a, a man in, in, in the prophetic program, a, a, a Jew in time past, these things could never have entered into his heart. It says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. He, there is no possible way for a Jew in time past to believe that these promises ever existed. It wasn't there. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. No, you don't. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, just because we need to wrap up now. Notice verse 14. He talks about the things that the Holy Ghost teaches. That's his word, the written revelation. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? There it is again. And then notice what he says. But we have the mind of Christ. He says, you have, who can know the mind of the Lord? But we have it. And we have it today because of God's revelation to a, once, at one point, we're a bunch of lost, far-off Gentiles. And that through Israel's unbelief, and that through Israel's fall, God pursues a new purpose to form one new man. And that this new man is now a blessing and carries God's word to the world through the apostleship of Paul and the, the revelation given to him. One last verse, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. Let me ask you a question. If we were to close this all up, and you just had, you know, time pass and ages to come, and this yellow part here is gone, would you be able to see completely the glory of God? Would you ever know in totality God's glory and his wisdom? No. See, 
it's this here, this secret purpose that he had, that he hid in himself. That's the very thing that, that puts on display fully his wisdom and his glory. Without it, you wouldn't see. You'd have just, you know, the dark heavens. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. He abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Romans 11 there says, Who hath known the mind of the Lord, who hath been his counselor, who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. It's of him. He's the source of knowledge and wisdom. It's his plan. It's his purpose. It's through him. He's the one that accomplishes the thing. He's the one that, that accomplishes the means by which this wisdom is executed. And it's to him. He is the recipient. He is the benefactor. And he says there he's abounded toward us in all wisdom and, pr wisdom and prudence, having made known. That's the thrilling part. He's made it known. He's made the secret of his will known to us. According to his good pleasure, this is the thing that pleases God, which he hath purposed in himself. Now, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And you see Israel's predicament remedied. And you see God's purpose with the body of Christ culminated and it glorifies and exalts God in the person of Jesus Christ. God's genius on display to glorify and exalt His Son for all eternity, and He's made us a part of that. Oh, the depth. And then you start to say, man, it really is deep. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. That's exciting, and we're a part of that. Father, we thank You just for these thrilling truths to learn about your purpose for heaven and earth that you will restore and fulfill your promise to Israel but now you're doing something different with us and we just thank you for for that opportunity and it's a privilege to serve you as a member of the body of Christ and to bring people uh, as ambassadors for Christ a message of your grace and peace of your mercy and then just show them the love of Christ we thank you for the privilege again in our time here. Amen.